dear ones. You're listening to the What God Is Not podcast with Father Michael O'Loughlin and Mother Natalia. Hello, listeners. This is Father Michael. Today is Mother Natalia's episode, and she is talking about humility with our special guest, Father Boniface Hicks. Please join us. Um, I would encourage you not to skip ahead in the banter because um, we do some uh, some loving on Mother Natalia um, that I thought was really beautiful um, from Father Boniface especially, but, um, but also from me. Um, we talk about humility, about how that is truth, how it is self-knowledge. We also have some humbling moments from ourselves and we tell some stories about people we've experienced and love who have lived out humility well. If you are a hashtag banter hater and want to skip ahead, which again, I greatly discourage on this one, but you could skip ahead six minutes from this recording. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Um, welcome, Father Boniface Hicks. Thanks. What a joy. Yeah. So nice to be with both of you. Two of my favorite people. Oh, this is Thank really you, sweet. Um, and he yeah. sounds like he really means it when he says that. So that's just really sweet. I know he does. I know. Well, I will say, uh, obviously, I know Mother Natalia better than uh, Father Michael, but I know Father Michael through the heart of Mother Natalia. And so oh. I would say that I also know the best of Father Michael. <laughs> and uh, I love him very much because I love him with the heart of Mother Natalia. <laughs> so. Oh, my gosh, Father. That's beautiful. That's like really profound. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're just just like what he said earlier when, <laughs> when Mother... <laughs> That's that, weird. That, Don't I, I'm, no. I'm I'm gonna I'm totally gonna use this because it was it was so brilliant because I have people that do this in my life all the time where they will they will bring up an issue with you and then like ex, like tell you the issue while at the same time either solving the issue or telling you how they're gonna help or giving you affirmation for the way that you're going to solve the issue. So so mother says something about I forget what it was even right now, but it was something about remembering something. Oh, that's what it was. Yeah, the topic. So remembering we talked about what the topic was going to be a few months ago. So mother says, um, you know, um, and, and if you'd like to do this, like you have a few minutes now to go ahead and do that. And Father Boniface goes, oh my gosh, it's just like you it exposed me and clothed me at the same time. It's like that. that is so true. I have so many people in my life that, that, that will need to critique something and they'll do it so well that you feel like they exposed me, then clothed me at the same time in the same motion. It's, it's brilliant when people can do that. Oh. What makes her so true to her name too, doesn't it? Yeah. The one who is without guile. Yeah, that's exactly it. And and she's and, and not worse. only is she without guile, but but she will like she will actively. I guess I guess I I think of guile as something that's that's very personal. But she actually shares that. It's a gift of being guileless, <laughs> and it, it overflows to those around her. Oh, guys, I can't do it's this. Too bad this isn't on video, so everybody could see how she's blushing. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> it's oh. nice to double team. Loving on Mother Natalia. So yes, thanks for that opportunity. Absolutely. The, um, absolutely. Our listeners often miss out on the video mostly so because they can't see me roll my eyes at Father Michael. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> or the blink, the blink looks when he makes a joke that I don't think is funny. <laughs> and then just say, that's not funny, instead of just letting it roll. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you like my guilelessness. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> She's just saying how she feels. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> um, but but it is it is a joy to have Father Boniface on. I honestly, Father Boniface, I was really excited when you said yes to being on the podcast because um, it was almost like secondary in my mind that you got to be on the podcast. The primary thing was <laughs> I get an hour with Father Boniface, and so Aww. that was really exciting. <laughs> Um, because we just see you far too infrequently. Um, it's really, that's the truth of it. Um, so, um, it gives us warning, Father Michael. I know. I don't. Sorry, we got. We got. I'm getting a photo for the. I don't, the, I don't think Father Boniface knew, so you might have to do it again later. <laughs> I, if you see a countdown. Nope, I'll have to do another one. Yeah, you can you can do another one later. <laughs> um, we're I trying know, to take supposed a photo. To pose. I'm like, <laughs> no, you, what's you, going on? I you. thought something was about to end. <laughs> <laughs> it's stopping. There's just a count. 
the second coming of Christ will give five seconds <laughs> on all computer screens. Oh. Sorry for our listeners. I was trying to take a photo for our, our Instagram feed. I just decided to do it because it popped into my ADD brain at the moment. <laughs> I didn't warn anybody. <laughs> Um, although Squadcast does warn us, but I knew that. And Father Father Boniface, and now I can't get this thing off the front of my. Oh, okay. Um, and so, anyways, poor poor Father Boniface. Um, okay. Well, do you guys have anything in particular that you want to talk about, or should I just jump into the topic? Father Michael, do you have anything you want to talk about? I'd like to talk about humility. Stop! Why would you do that? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, I was actually thinking that at the beginning um, when you guys were both just loving on me and affirming me, and I was like, "I'm this is the perfect banter for today because I am not humble enough to receive this." Like, I'm just squirming um, inside my skin. Is that the squirming in my skin is you, not right? You you are kind of squirming. I'm I'm kind of surprised because you know both of us so well, and I'm trying to figure out why you why you're being a little bit little more awkward than usual. Are you, are you just nervous because we have Father Boniface on? I guess. I think, I think that's it. I think it, it is. Okay. Father, I'm just like, I get like a, a little girl in front of Father Boniface that I, I just feel all jittery and awkward. Um, I think that's what it is. But I, it's also, it's always hard when we have a guest, not like, it's just hard for me to navigate the dynamic. Um because of my awkwardness. Like I there's now the dynamic is different and that's fine, but I don't know when I'm supposed to pause for other people to talk or when I'm supposed to it's just really hard for me. <laughs> Aww. I'm not You're doing great. <laughs> thank you, you Father Anonymous. Pat, 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 pat. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna imitate Mother Natalia being condescending. That's fine. Father Boniface was not, he meant it. Father Michael added in the head pat. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, okay, fine. So the topic today, I wanted to talk about humility because, um, and I think actually after I asked Father Boniface about this, or maybe after I had just had the, the idea, uh, one of our listeners reached out and was like, hey, can you do an episode on humility? Because I think that would be really helpful. And I I wanted to talk about it because there's this problem that I see frequently in Christian circles um, and in my own life of just far too often thinking that humility means that I'm a piece of poop or something, right? Like that humility means that there is, there is no goodness in me. And, um, and that's just not true, but that's what we act out of, right? It's like, oh, this person gave me a compliment. I must deny it because that's humility or um, I'm really, I did a really good job of this thing. I'm going to say I didn't do it because that's not humble and things like that. You know, it's just, why, why are you smirking Father Michael? That's other things. My ADD brain, it has nothing to do with what you're talking about. I promise. Are you even listening to me? (laughs) I am. I'm actually listening to every single word. (laughs) Okay. So, um, so anyways, I think that we can often have this misconception of what humility is. And I wanted to try to clear that up a little bit um, for listeners and maybe also for myself. And um, quite frankly, you guys can't deny this because then you're going to destroy everything I just said about what humility is not. But um, but you're two of the most humble people that I know, um, very specifically two of the most humble men that I know. And so I think you can both speak volumes to this. Um, I also was hoping that Father Boniface could bring in a little bit of his knowledge of Greek, um, because he always has amazing things to say um, about what the Greek words in scripture mean and so on and so forth. Uh, There's something else that I feel like I was going to say before I just opened it up to, um, I don't know. I think it's, you know what, like Father Michael, when we were joking before recording about how um, I can say things that And we've talked about this on the podcast before as well. But like, I can say things that to an outsider who doesn't know me probably sound condescending. Like when I'm like, oh, Father Michael, you called your mom. Good job. Um, But that I don't mean it in a condescending way. And but but even more so, like you don't receive it in a condescending way. And I think that's just like an instance of your humility. Um, Because some people could just be so 
Like they might be puffed off. They might be instantly on the defense because it's like they're feeling guilty about the fact that they don't call their mom enough. And so now they're going to like overreact in order to um, convince themselves that they're not a bad person for not, you know, like things like that. Um, And so even though I, I use that as kind of a joking example, I think that there's also some truth um, in that of, yeah. So uh, whichever one of you wants to say anything, just like, it's hard when there's three people. I don't know how to, yeah. You're doing great. Thanks. I was loving it. No, I I think uh, I actually was uh, marveling as you were talking that you've gotten through 127 podcasts without talking about humility. uh, (laughs) uh, I don't mean that in a bad way, but you know, it's just like, it is one of those things. I I would say, uh, first of all, it's, you know, uh, the the two specifically Christian virtues are humility and charity, uh, and 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 that's what really sets us apart from you know Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics and and his whole structure. Humility is not a virtue for Aristotle; it's a virtue for Christians. And of course, charity is the perfection of all of the virtues for Christians. And so, in some sense, the ground of everything is humility, and then the height of everything is charity. And really, if we can wedge everything between those, uh, or we're in the, the constellation of those two, we we have everything in the Christian life. And it's one of the reasons, uh, you know, I think we do. I, th- I think you do. We do a, a little better in the in the Greek and the monastic fathers uh, because of the the structure. Humility gets kind of buried in the Thomistic system several layers down under the the cardinal virtue of temperance. And it's like, what is it doing down there? You know, it just seems a little bit awkward. Thomas speaks about it in the right terms, but just sort of in the standard structure of the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, and the four cardinal virtues of justice, prudence, fortitude, and temperance. And then, you know, humility is a sub-virtue of this, uh, whereas humility is actually so central. It's so fundamental. It, it really captures the, the whole of our humanity, and then charity captures the whole of the divinization that we are brought into. Uh, God, who is love, of course, is divinizing us to make him one with himself. Uh, so humility is, is just so fundamental and, uh, and so important. And as you said very beautifully, Mother, the, so misunderstood, a, a lot of times uh, twisted into a false humility, really, of putting oneself down, making oneself less than than uh, what one really is, and and uh, or, or you know acting uh, acting in a certain way, a certain kind of persona that someone is supposed to put on if they're uh, a Christian or something, and and gets uh, gets twisted around. But I always I always come back to the simple definition of humility is truth, and then you know of course you can contextualize that in the right ways, but uh, but just to to start with that, and I, I, I heard that in you know what you're saying, uh, being able to accept the truth that is spoken about you and, and the compliments and affirmation that is there, and, and uh, then, then being able to take things kind of at face value, not, not unrelated to um, Nathaniel and being without guile. There isn't a, a twisting or a, a, you know, some other differentiating of the truth, but, but just uh, things, letting things be the way that they are and, and owning that. Mm-hmm. And I think when it comes to us who are always unclear about the truth, who are always seeking truth, who are, are, are finding it to a certain extent and being confused about it and getting it wrong sometimes, um, the truth, humility for us is, is knowing ourselves, is finding out the truth. We, in a sense, spend our whole life finding out the truth of who we are. And so when, when we, when we, the more we know that, the more humble we are. We, we, see a, we, ourselves, we see ourselves as we truly are. And so, of course, the most humble person is going to be Christ himself because he, he, he knew himself um, to be the son of God. He knew himself to be someone on the, on the podcast we just recorded, Father, we were talking about Jacob wrestling with God. And how there's a how how the the this angel this man that he wrestles with um, is is weak and how that's a, a foreshadowing of Christ who chose to be weak, um, who chose to in a sense be to be conquered. Um, and there's a when we know ourselves, then we can actually be charitable. And, and the image that came to mind was. I, I, I said that Father, the humility is the ground, and so that we can have the the charity is the height. And when we know ourselves well enough, we have a certain freedom 
um, to act outside of ourselves. We have a, so Christ who, who knew himself to be God, who knew himself <clears throat> to be perfect and, and, and beyond suffering, beyond sin, chose to go outside of himself in a sense. I don't know if that's the right phrase, chose to do something that wasn't of him as a gift. And I, I think that's how humility, knowing ourselves, the truth of who we are, as knowing our, our tendencies to sin, knowing our temptations, knowing our beauty, knowing our, our gifts, knowing our knowing ourselves and everything God has given us, knowing our vocations, when we are content in that and rest in that. And that comes with, with you know, uh, awarenesses that are pointed out to us sometimes that are embarrassing, but, but a, a human soul says, okay, I've learned something about myself. I've learned that I may say things the way, and I, I mean them differently than they're perceived, something like this. But, but I, I love the fact that God could could act in a way and even become something that wasn't of Him, that that was beyond that truth and being weak, and being crucified, and and having His soul severed of His body. He did something that that was was in a sense beyond Him, and He did it as a gift. Um, and so I think when we are say when St. Paul says, you know, I am all things to all people, that may be one of the things he means. You know, we're, we're in truth, we're not, but we, we can we can adapt once we are comfortable and content in our own skin and when we are are aware more and more throughout our life of the truth of who we truly are. And of course the greatest example of that is Christ. Mm-hmm. Um because there so there is this aspect of if we're humble, we don't have to deny the gifts that we have because we can acknowledge the truth of them. Um, but there's the other side of it as well that, like you're saying, Father Michael, if people are pointing out faults or, or whatever it is, uh, weaknesses, um, sins, there's, if, you know, to use this definition of humility being truth, it's like we know these things about ourselves as well. We know that we need to grow. Um, and it goes hand in hand with with the confidence, like, the, the truth of knowing who we are in relationship with God and in relation to God means that we can have confidence that he will help us with that growth, um, that we're not alone in it. And so I, I think humility, it like, it's not, um, it's in some sense, I think, a tempering. Uh, I'm only thinking of this in the moment, so I don't know, but it's it's in some sense of te- a tempering of um, if someone says that I have a gift, um, I can just say, well, thank you, and like move on with life. Um, but similarly, if if someone points out a fault, I can say, thank you, and, and move on with life, you know? And um, as, a, as opposed to this, like, we overreact in both directions, in both of those instances, um, because, because of our lack of humility. Mm-hmm. No, beautifully said. Yeah. Yeah, to, to own who we are. And, and I guess... Uh, uh, you pointed out the false humility that can be prevalent in Christianity. And I, I'm always looking for where the truth is in those things. How did those things come to be? And of course, the hard thing of humility is often to admit our failures, uh, to admit our weaknesses, our sins, our limitations, which of course we fundamentally have, right? <laughs> what do you have that you have not received? As St. Paul said, in our humanity, we, we have limitation. We didn't create ourselves and we don't sustain ourselves in being. We don't really uh, take, have credit for all of the gifts that we have. And the things that we most depend on in our daily life are not things that we own. They're things that are on loan to us. <laughs> so there's lots to be humble about in that sense uh, of, of owning the limitations. That's often the more challenging thing. And so there's a kind of truth in that idea that, well, the humble person is the one who knows his or her limitations and uh, but then to actually name the limitations rather than to name I, either to make it worse, uh, which is not actually owning our limitations. There's a kind of smoke screen that's there because if somebody makes fun of that, it's not really making fun of us. It's making fun of this over-exaggerated limitation that I just created for myself. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's that, that dimension. But, but as you, as you both pointed out, I mean, Owning our gifts can also be challenging, but then again, humility is recognizing that even our gifts are a gift, precisely that word. Mm -hmm. Uh, St. Therese described this in terms of littleness, which I actually think is really useful uh, because little things are lovable. And that's part of the problem that we have with acknowledging uh, how, you know, poverty is another word that's sort of related. Poverty has a kind of... uh, negative quality to it. I mean, we, we don't want to be like the, 
the beggar on the street or something. And, and humility also has this sort of quality to it. Littleness has, the, has that sense of lovable built into limitation. And, and I think that's really helpful. So St. Saint, Saint Therese says, you know, littleness means knowing that God has placed his gifts in the hands of his little child, even, even her virtues has placed these gifts in the hand of her little child uh, for a time, but they always remain his gifts. And so that's where we acknowledge to say, if someone says, well, you're so gifted in this way, and we say, well, thank you. And then authentically, we can say, well, thanks be to God. Uh, it really is his gift. And I'm so happy that I've used it well enough that you can see it. Mm-hmm. I can own that. My free will is, my, is really mine. It's all I have. <laughs> and so there is a way of merit. There is a choice that I make. I can use the gift well or not. But I also know it's his gift. And I'm happy to have it. And I'm happy to use it. And I'm happy you could see it. And I'm happy to give him glory for it. And that's part of my being, my being fully alive. But sort of getting all of that in the right way is is wrapped around the self-knowledge that Father Michael spoke about in, in the, you know, in the virtue of, of humility. Yeah. I, I like that. Um, <clears throat> I like your, your solution of giving the twofold, like, um, thank you. And thank like, thanks be to God as well, you know, and like owning your part in it. Cause it like, that can be so infuriating, right. When, when you thank people for things and they're just like, totally, and they just try to pass it off to just like, well, God did this. And it's like, Yes, but also we don't believe in like, <laughs> like we have free will. Yeah. Um, and, and we need to acknowledge um, the goodness of that as well. Uh, yeah. So that can be just really, really frustrating. There's, there's also this, do you have something you want to say to that, Father Michael, before I? I, I, have, a, I have a story. I was going to say, I, I think it'd be great if, if you guys think of it at some point in this episode, if we could like where the rubber hits the road, where we've seen <clears throat> humility in action mm-hmm. in others. Um, and I, I have a quick story about about that. So I think maybe finish your thought, Mother, and then... Well, we I was just thinking, stories, I would love this, is a, this is another story of, um, and it's one I've told on the podcast before, but of uh, a, a realization I had of a lack of humility <clears throat> within myself. So... Um, as you were talking, Father Boniface, about like, I can't believe it, it took you guys 127 episodes to get to humility. I <clears throat> I had this thought of, um, wait a second, I've totally done an episode on humility. <laughs> and so then I pulled up our episode list. I wasn't going to call you and, out. <laughs> well, I, I think at one point I knew that I had done one before, but like this was different than than what I wanted yeah. to talk about. Like, so um, good. see, Father Michael, you're so humble. Like you could have used that as an opportunity <laughs> to say that you're right. And instead you didn't call me out on it. Um, except then you kind of lost humility points by bringing it up later. Has never done it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, but the the reason so it was episode forty three. Word from Opustinic humility, and so if any of you want to go listen to that, you can. But um, I was I was really sharing my my experience of personal conviction on one of my Pustinias, um, in which the Lord revealed to me my my lack of humility. And, uh, but it was like so subtle the way that I was realizing this pride <clears throat> because I, I, I think this is what I talked about on that episode. I can't remember for sure, but I, I realized that there are times that, um, I'm like, say I'm just a jerk to one of the other nuns and I'm super snippy and whatever the thing. And then, um, and then I see that I've done this. So I decide to go apologize to her. And I'm just like, oh, look at me. I'm so good and humble going to apologize for this thing and whatever the thing is, right? And then <clears throat> I go and apologize. And then only later do I realize I wasn't really apologizing for the sake of it. Like there was something in there that's I want this person to know that I see this fault in myself And I don't want them to think that I did it without, um, knowing it. And so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna apologize so that they know that like, I am aware of it and you don't have to point it out to me. And, and there's just like something in there that's not humility. Like I'm not going in the sense of, and, and the way that I can just hold on to the things even after I apologize, um, it's like, I want some kind of restitution, um, some kind of 
repayment for the the fact that I've wronged this person, and I'm unwilling to just accept the free forgiveness. Um, and and like that's also just a, a lack of humility. Um, so I think that's another aspect of it. Yeah, there's a way that you're trying to control the other person's judgment <laughs> and mm-hmm. tell them that they're supposed to see you in this particular way that you see yourself. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what's happening inside of me and I'll be in control of that rather than yeah. leaving it in the other person's hands, which is more vulnerable. I, I'd love to, to, to wrap that in uh, sooner or later as well. Uh, the word vulnerability has become very popular. It's not a biblical word, um, but I do think it's very related to... Uh, to humility. Humility is the, but I think vulnerability actually has held on to its essence a little bit better than humility has. Humility mm. has been sort of spread out in these ways, like you described earlier, a lot of false concepts and connotations and things like that. I think vulnerability has captured that sort of unprotected, exposed, what you see is what you get quality of truth uh, that that humility is also uh, aiming at. Um. Father Michael, do you want to tell your story? Sure. And now, now I'm paranoid that I haven't told this already. But anyway, I'll tell it again anyway. It's okay. Um, you haven't told it to me. I'm I'm, I'm not yeah. humble enough to uh, to just tell it. Yeah, <laughs> to leave it at that. Um, so uh, we had this priest, and I was probably in like my community college year at my parish in De- in Albuquerque, and uh, we had a priest covering, and this priest came in, and he he was a biritual priest. So he wasn't used to the divine liturgy as much as he was, as much as I was even being just an altar server. And so he, he messed up quite a few things and would have to go back and, and do something or ask questions while on the altar. And I remember getting frustrated by this, but the thing that frustrated me most was that he looked so incredibly happy Mm. sovereign liturgy. Like, he was messing up all over the place. He did not let it get him down. He just looked joyful. He was glowing. And and I remember thinking, that's true humility. Like the true humility is that if he if he thinks he's doing something wrong, he asks. And he knows he's messing it up. He's he's very aware that this isn't going as planned and there's things he's forgotten. He doesn't quite know what to do right now. So he's asking questions. And and I realized in this, I'm the devil. Like I, I'm the one wanting him to feel something other than joy. In, in the divine liturgy, like in the Eucharistic celebration. But I was I was so frustrated. I didn't, I think the joy made me think that he didn't know that he was doing something wrong. Mm. Like, like if, if, you, if you're if you doing something wrong, I, if I was doing something wrong, I would feel shame and I'd be apologizing every moment and I would be awkward and I would just want to be get it over with. And I, I would not want, to, I, I would not be in the moment. I wouldn't be receiving the grace that the Lord obviously wanted me to give in that moment. So um, I was I was the devil. I was the one desiring to, to find shame and weakness that, that he and the fact that he didn't made me uncomfortable. Um, but he was just he was just celebrating the liturgy, and and he was so humble to to really let he if he had been apologizing all the time, he actually would have made it worse. You know, it it, it would have distracted from the celebration. But he he was doing it right, and and even though he was messing up, he was he was covering in a sense and making up or letting the joy of Christ make up for his his mistakes. And I I remember thinking, like I that's what I want, even though. I know people are going to be like me. Mm-hmm. People are going to do what I did. They're going to see me be a joyful mess, and they're going to say that guy's a mess. I don't want to be around him. Like, <laughs> why can't he get better? Like, I I know they're going to do exactly what I did, and I I, I know that that's the devil. I know that, but that, but most a lot of people are going to react that way, and I just need to be humble enough to say, hopefully they'll come to the conclusion I did that that that's actually what humility looks like, and I want to be that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love the word transparency. You know, it's mm-hmm. what you see is what you get. Uh, yeah. He didn't try to put on airs. He didn't try to be something other than he was. He was happy to be what he was, even knowing that it's limited. And he wasn't going to try to cover up his ignorance. He's just going to let it be seen and uh, give what he has. And then you, uh, the joy was also transparent. That's what yeah. was really in his heart, even when he was uh, making mistakes and things like that. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I think this is just a very little example, but there's a... I one one nun in particular does this, but um, but actually, I think a, a few different I've seen do this at points. But it's like there will be times at uh, 
when someone is, it's, it's particularly with guests. It's not when there's, it's just the community, but um, when there's something that's said at dinner reading or a guest says this uh, like really profound thing and they're like very theologically trained or something like that. And, um, and there have been times where a guest will say something and I'm like, I have no idea what that word means. Like that is a big word and it's fancy and I don't, I don't know what it means. And so I nod my head and like, and just listen as, as they continue. And then one of the nuns will be like, what's that word mean? Um, and, uh, and so I've started doing that. Like I've started just mm-hmm. before I can even think about it and talk myself out of it, I'll just interrupt and be like, what's that word mean? Um, because I know that's something I have to, like I'm so concerned about whether or not um, people think I'm smart that I am unwilling to just admit that like, I don't really know a lot about anything. Um, and um, so it's like, I I just was, was raised, like my whole childhood, I feel like I was always putting on um, this air of um, being smart. I think just because I tested well, like for whatever reason I test well. And so I was very, it was very easy to like make people think that I was smart. Um, and uh, yeah, I've just been like really edified in seeing there are a lot of things like that that you notice in community life, like in in a community like this, right? Where um, I'm not saying we excel at virtue, but I am saying that every one of us like wants to excel at virtue, right? Like we're all trying mm-hmm. to grow. And so even if this nun really struggles with this particular vice, like there are so many other areas where I know I can grow from her. And the same is true of, of everyone in the community. Um, and so I see different instances of humility in the different nuns that it's, it's really helpful to, you know, like the one who, um, like I saw the nun leave the dirty dish in the sink. I saw someone come up to a different nun and say, Hey, please remember to rinse the dishes. And I saw that different nun say, um, oh, thanks for the reminder. And then rinse the dish that's not theirs. And like, you know, um, and, and they don't have to defend themselves. And anyway, so those are just like little examples, but. Yeah, it's beautiful. I had yeah. a friend who, uh, if, if they didn't know a word, they would just sit there and ask Siri right in front of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Siri, <what? laughs> that's amazing. That is, that's like, hilarious. Well, we don't have that cell phones really to do that, <laughs> but <laughs> but if I'm like traveling and I have a phone, I might start doing that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, I, I was thinking of uh, a, a story that I, I heard. This is secondhand, but a friend of mine who was in Rome uh, came across the path of Cardinal Ratzinger, who apparently would walk the same path from his apartment to the, his office in the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And I can't even remember, they may have known that and waited out for him or whatever the story was, <laughs> but they saw him and went over to him just as he's walking, making his normal little commute in the morning and said, you know, your eminence, uh, could we could we take a picture? And he, he just, oh, I'd be happy to. And he was going to take the camera from them to take a picture of them, <laughs> like very sincerely. Yeah. And, and, and that's, a, I think, such a beautiful expression of humility when, when someone who, you know, has a, has a high office but, but lives that out, like I'm a, you know, I'm a person and uh, I'm not presuming that it's because I'm so famous and well-known that you want to be seen with me. I, if you want to say that, fine, you know, I'll accept I know who I am, but I'm also a guy and I'm happy to take your picture. And so uh, just not considering himself above other things. And I, talking about humility makes me, and, and that story makes me think of the opposite. Mother wants me to talk about Greek, but I, I'll, uh, and I will, but I have to be <laughs> honest, the, the Latin words are, uh, are very present to me. We'll allow, we'll of, allow Latin on this podcast as well. <laughs> <laughs> in, in terms of the word humility, which comes from the Latin hummus, which means ground, but also the opposite of it, pride. I think pride Wait also gets Wait a second, confused. hummus means ground? Yeah, yeah. Okay. But in this Latin, is a not, not Arabic. Okay. Yes, hum- hummus means okay. ground. Please keep going. <laughs> well, I was like, like ground chickpeas. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh my gosh, I'm so not humble. I'm like, my whole face is beat red right now. 
<laughs> Please keep talking yeah. about Latin. <laughs> I don't know the relationship between the Arabic hummus and the Latin hummus. Anyway. We'll have to look that up another time. You can ask Siri maybe. But, <laughs> um, but so, so the word, the word, uh, yes, uh, humility, hummus uh, from ground again. Uh, so. Uh, but but then the opposite, pride. Pride also gets very confused, I think. And the Latin helps us with uh, with pride too, which is superbia, and it's a sense of superiority. It's a false superiority, and somebody that that is uh, claiming a superiority, lording it over another, looking down on someone else, is uh, it's always false because we really don't ever have anything over anyone. <laughs> Because we're all made of the same stuff. We're all, the, we're all beggars before the throne. We're all recipients of divine grace. We're all created by God and redeemed by Him. We're all equally in need of Him. And so there's, a, there's always a dimension of pride when there's a superiority that, again, looks down on, that lords it over. And so just uh, coming back to that example with Cardinal Ratzinger, he, he wasn't sort of, uh, this is beneath me, you know, to take mm-hmm. your picture uh, he just thought that's actually what they were asking. And who knows, maybe their Italian was such that they actually asked that and mm-hmm. he didn't take any offense at it, but it was like, sure, I'm happy to take your picture. <laughs> and and that's, uh, that's, that's humility. That's, uh, I think, uh, a nice illustration of that. Um, I have a great similar story with uh, Trevor Williams, the baseball player now for the Mets. And um, he invited... Um, me to bring my nephews to the field, and I had never met him in person. We'd only we'd only talked on the phone. So I brought my my nephews to the field, and so we go to, before they were they were at that time he played for the Pirates, and they were playing the Rockies in Denver, and so we go down to the field before the game begins, and he he we go down to the field, and he says, "Would you guys like some bubble gum or some sunflower seeds from the dugout?" I said, "Oh yeah." So he brings out little packets of sunflower seeds and bubble gum from the dugout, and then he brings them each a baseball. And he and a pen, and he says, you know, here here's the baseball, and, and all the other players are doing batting practice on the field, and he and he says, um, hey, here here's a you can actually have like any of these players sign this ball, like any of them, and he just hands them the ball, and they start looking around at the other players, and I'm like, I'm like, Trevor. Like they want you to sign it too, but he's like he took on such this like any baseball player that you want to sign it like like and they they kind of they were kids so they reacted to his humility by saying oh he he's he just he's showing us like look look at all these famous people here you can have to sign the baseball <laughs> so I was like they want you to sign so he signed it all first and they went off to have other other players sign it. but it was, it was just it was it was really funny how it was he was he wanted them to have such a good time that he didn't even sign the ball first he just That's like look beautiful. look at all these famous people it was it was beautiful yeah that's really yeah. interesting father boniface about the what you were saying about pride because i just a few weeks ago i was talking with a a priest friend of mine um we were we were speaking in spanish and i was talking to him like he uh when he's here he speaks spanish with me just to help me practice but i was talking to him about how um it's difficult for me to practice conversation in spanish because of my pride but the word that I used for pride, he corrected me on. And he was like, he was like, no, that's not really the word. Like if someone comes to confession and they're confessing the sin of pride, that's not the word they're going to use because that word is more for like, I'm proud of someone for doing something or, or whatever. Um, I'm proud of my children or whatever. But the other word is soberbia. So it is like it, it maintained that root of the, mm-hmm. the being superior. Um, and so... That's just, yeah, that's interesting. And I, I might even say, uh, not to, to doubly correct you, but just because you've given this example uh, to, to keep looking at it, really there's another way that we're not humble that's actually what we would call vanity uh, or vainglory. And this is where the, uh, uh, the, the Greek, uh, whatever, is it uh, doxa, the... Empty, anyway, it turns into empty glory in Greek. Mm. Uh, I say chanodoxa, but that's not. Uh, I think that's different. Anyway, the uh, it turns into empty glory, vain glory, and mm. uh, and uh, and and that's where we want to appear better. We want to appear better than we are, so that we get the praise, the empty glory of of human beings. And so that's yet a different kind of. So there's the actual. I think I'm greater than I am, and I act that way. 
That's superbia. That's superiority. Uh, but then there's the, I want to appear better than I am. I, I don't want people to see my bad parts. I don't want people to, I want people to think more of me than I am. And then I'm really seeking this empty glory from people. And uh, so I think there's a useful distinction. I mean, in some sense, it doesn't matter. They're both not humble and they're both uh, uh, imperfect, you know, sinful in that sense. Uh, but maybe two different, they're, they're exposing two different movements in the heart that uh that are useful to identify that's super helpful um no pun intended with the super because i when i when i've talked to people about the eight evil thoughts which um i eventually want to do an episode on um i'm i've always been a little bit um stumped when i get to the difference between pride and vainglory um and i had kind of in my head come up with something of like it seems when I'm reading Cashin, it seems because um, it's easier to find stuff that he's written about it than Evagrius, but um, it seems to be that that pride is about what I think of myself and vainglory being more what others think of me, which is um, similar, I think, to what you're saying. But uh, um, that that empty glory of that's that's just a really helpful distinction. So. Um, that's something I've been trying to figure out for years that I should have asked you about a long time ago, clearly. <laughs> and I think the word vanity is useful. We we've captured it's not it doesn't perfectly capture it, but it gives a more uh, sort of visceral sense of it. Vainglory sounds a little kind of strange and awkward, and maybe is useful because it captures perhaps more precisely the the idea. But that's really vain. That's uh, we tend to do that only towards physical appearance. But it would be anything that. I want you to think I'm smarter than I am. I want you mm-hmm. to be, uh, I want to show off because I want you to think I'm really great or that I have all these accomplishments or I want to, I want to use big words so that you, uh, uh, you know, have to talk to Siri to find out what I'm talking <laughs> about. Uh, you know, lots of different ways of posturing, putting up a superficial front so that you get distracted about who I am and you think I'm better than I am. Uh, whereas that's, you know, not me actually being superior. It's it's me uh, hiding behind a behind a, a mask. Um, there was there was a moment, Father Boniface. Uh, this was a very long time ago. This was a couple of years ago. Father Michael and I were recording, and I was talking about something about ontology. And then, um, as the conversation continues, Father Michael's like, "Well, we have to be careful using the word ontology there because blah blah blah." And he's like going on and on about how, like, basically, I like had messed up something about what I was saying. And then I'm just kind of sitting there listening. And then finally I just go, I don't know what ontology means. And (laughs) I just used it because I heard it one time in a story. And so I thought this was the time to use it. And I just need to say that I don't know what it means. Um, That's That's beautiful. But uh, (laughs) yeah. Um, The... Yeah, I the 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 vanity aspect is true as well, and and vainglory. I like that is I like that a lot. That was something that um, I think I've probably shared parts of this on the podcast before, but that was like one of the most profound parts of my retreat with Father Boniface um, a, a few years ago, um, before my life profession. That um, I in one of our meetings, I was just like. I'm like really struggling with vainglory and, and I don't know how to get over it. And, um, so, and that ended up being just really beautiful. So, um, Father Boniface helped a lot with that. Father Boniface, could you do me a favor and just introduce yourself to, uh, just who you are? That's and just speaking, you know, speaking of, we, we should have done that at the very beginning, but I was just, I was just anyway, it's, it's, this is my episode, Father people, Michael. And so it was really <laughs> humble of you to just say we should have done that at the beginning. <laughs> that was very good of you. So I, I think, I think most people have heard your name or, or seen you on other, on other, other media platforms. But if you could, if you could just introduce like who you are and, and what you do, please. <laughs> <laughs> sure, happy to. <laughs> uh, I'm a, I'm a Benedictine monk uh, in the uh, Latin rite, and uh, also a priest. Obviously, I was uh, entered the monastery at Saint Vincent Arch Abbey. Uh, monks make a vow of stability, so I'm a Benedictine at Saint Vincent. We could say there's a uh, every every Benedictine monastery has a little different in, uh, application of the rule, etc. So. 
Uh, I'm, I'm a Benedictine at St. Vincent in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and uh, entered in 98, 1998, and, and was ordained in 2004. Um, fun fact, I was baptized in 1997, so it's always mm-hmm. fun for people. You can find out more about my story on my website, mm-hmm. fatherboniface.org. But uh, I'm the spiritual director at our seminary. We, uh, we formed diocesan priests as well as our own monks, and I also run a, uh, an institute, and we have a spiritual direction program. I, I love to teach about prayer and the spiritual life, and so this is uh, the stuff that I live and breathe and uh, love to discuss, and just, uh, yeah. Amen. A few, a few bits. Thanks. We, uh, we've been talking about well, I don't. I don't want to share too much here, but anyway, the, the getting empowering, empowering people, especially women, to to take on the role of 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 spiritual director, and I think you'd be a good resource for how that works. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, we have a our spiritual direction program right now has a, about I don't know sixty sixty five students in it, and a lot of women who are uh, just really beautiful disciples. And uh, great followers of the Lord, uh, deep women of prayer, deep compassion, empathy, capacity to listen, and really to enter into someone's uh, spiritual life and and support them on that journey. And I think there's a I think there's a real real place for that. I know I know women and men, uh, even even priests who have uh, female spiritual directors and have been extremely blessed by that. Uh, the the mother role is uh, something beautiful, as we know from Mother Natalia and her other mothers there in uh, Christ the Bridegroom Monastery. There's there's something very beautiful about a mother who knows how to listen and take into the heart and enter into uh, someone's spiritual life. So, yeah, I certainly have uh, I've I've really appreciated our our women in the program. I think that's a greatly underutilized resource in our parishes. I had a moment when I realized that when uh, this this young woman, college student, after a confession, uh, just said to me, "You know, Father, I'm really looking for a, a spiritual director. Um, would you have the time and ability to do that?" And and it just it broke my heart to say no, but I had to say no. I said, "You know, I I've made a promise to myself and my spiritual director that I would only take parishioners because as our as our parishes grow, I I need to be available." Um, and she said, well, then kind of what everybody says, you know, well, then who, who, do you recommend anybody who I can go to? And then the first person that popped into my mind was, was Hope Schneer, just a, a, a friend of mine, an amazing mom, wife, um, writer, musician, um, and, and just has become a, has become someone who is, uh, sees me, I've become transparent to, not by my own will, but I just feel like she can really see into my soul. There's been other women like that too that I, I've, I've been very willing to let them let them see to the heart, and they've been they've been invited by my guardian angel, I may say, with, without anything explicitly from me to to speak to some of my weaknesses that I may not see, or or just to warn me about things that that may be on the horizon because of the way I act, the way I think, the way I behave. And she's been one of those amazing. So I, I recommended that, and it has been the most amazing thing for this young woman. Mm. Um, to, 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 and she, this girl has an amazing mom. I mean, it's 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 you know she has an amazing biological mother, and now an amazing spiritual mother mm. that that has been guiding her and has been so 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 good as she shares with me. And I thought this is just an an, an untapped resource is is spiritual motherhood um, for those who who. Who who recognize that difference between spiritual father and spiritual mother, and are able to to receive from that mm. reality? Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, it'd be fun to do an episode on spiritual direction sometime. But mm. I, uh, one of the one of the things we really promote in our program is the importance of vulnerability and mm. fostering an environment of uh, seeing the person that uh, enables them to be vulnerable and to really share the heart. As you were just describing, you've become transparent. She's even able to see your heart, right? This is vulnerability and it's humility as we've described it as well. Uh, I, I wrestled, I was, I was uh, asked by uh, a great uh, Norbertine priest who's done a lot of work in religious life. And he said, uh, you know, what, what is vulnerability? Where does that come from in the tradition? And, you know, it seems like more of a psychological word and, 
And uh, so it's, it got me thinking and I thought, well, yeah, vulnerability is sort of like humility in relationship. Mm. So humility can somehow be like just in myself. I can be a humble person, but vulnerability is always in relationship. Mm. And it's being humble in relationship in, uh, specifically. And, and we, we also teach the importance of the, uh, of the spiritual director's vulnerability, not in the sense that there's a symmetry that the spiritual director is also pouring out his or her heart to the directee. That would be uh, inappropriate. But, but that the, the spiritual director is, is vulnerable enough, receptive enough, open enough to receive the directee and is affected by that. Uh, so real empathy is willing to be to allow my heart to be like soft wax so that your story presses in on it and leaves marks there. And and I'm willing to be affected by you and and your story and to not just sort of coldly analyze something and give some set of prescriptions, but that I'm really able to, willing to take you in and and, uh, that my heart can be pierced with, with your story. And that sort of transparency, humility, vulnerability. And I allow that to be seen uh, the way that you affect me is uh, visible on my face, my gestures, and in my words in some sense. I'm not sort of sharing my own life with you, but I'm sharing the way that your life affects me. And I'm sharing that back with you in a, in, in a humble and a transparent and a vulnerable way. So to tie that into the theme of humility, I think humility is really so much at the essence of spiritual direction. And one of the things that spiritual direction should foster in both the the directee and the and the director, and that's you know the ideal of the, the sort of Russian starets is uh, is total self revelation, right? That that I'm completely seen as I am. That's that's humility. That's that's uh, the, the full revelation that we're aiming for, and and can foster as there's real trust developed uh, with the spiritual director. That if you see me as I am, you won't reject me, but you'll you'll love me, embrace me and help to form me in the likeness of Christ. Hmm. I think that that very much, any, any, any humility that you, you do see in me, mother that you mentioned is, is for that reason. I wrote that down earlier because when you, when you've been so well loved and forgiven so many times, and I, I think that forgiveness is very much a part of it that when, when you, when you, you feel like someone who has been forgiven and you, you, you've, you you n- never really forget that you have so many people that love you immensely and unconditionally, and those same people, for the most part, have forgiven you so much. Then you you like why not be vulnerable? Mm. Why why not be open and and say I just I want to know myself because I've realized that that my true self is lovable because people who have forgiven me love me even though I've hurt them or done something stupid. So there, there's a, I, I am loved by others and that helps me understand that I'm loved by God, but I'm also loved in my weakness. Um, and therefore, why not lean into that and actually embrace what the weakness is? And and when you've had that experience over and over and over again, it's, in my experience, it's actually startling when someone uses it against you because that will happen. Mm. You know, people will, like I did with that priest, you know, but not out loud, thank God, but people will even out loud use our vulnerability and our weaknesses against us. And and that should not scare us because if we do, we're acting out of fear. But um, I've been so well loved and forgiven by so many that it's actually startling when someone does that. It's mm. it, it I, I feel like this is, this it is unjust, but this, this is something that kind of shocks me. Like, oh, I, I expected something else. I actually expected, I expected forgiveness, which is a beautiful, I hope a childlike way of going about the world, even though it's quite naive. <laughs> but, but, um, but I guess that's childlike too. So there, but there is something about that, you know, thank God and thank those people who have, who have made it actually pretty easy um, to live a life of, of desiring self-knowledge and desiring truth to the extent that, that we do um, because of what others have given us in that gift of, of love and, and forgiveness. Mm. Mm, beautifully said. Yeah. Yeah. To be, to be accepted uh, in our unadorned <laughs> mm-hmm. self presentation, our unadorned reality is uh is is so beautiful <laughs> to and, be expo- yeah. exposed and clothed all at once. Clothed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. It's so sweet. Yeah. Uh, can I can I read something real quick? Um, yeah. This is so, Father. You are a man that follows a rule of life, of course, and so are you, Mother. Um, I'm not a man. Who I was follows the a rule of life, but I well, know. yeah, <laughs> a human. Um, 
when I was in the Companions of Christ, we we were diocesan priests that desired to live by some sort of a rule that was not we were not as bound to as as both of you are, um, since it was not a religious order. Um, but um, I want to read the paragraph on vulnerability. This was this was written by the, the brothers who formed it, and and treasured it enough. There's some beautiful paragraphs on on respect, on tolerance, and then on, on mutual help, on friendship. But this is a paragraph on, on so part of the rule of, of a shared life, of a life of community among diocesan priests. Um, so this is the paragraph on vulnerability. It's just called a, a common life of vulnerability. There's common life of friendship, common life um, of fraternal communion, of mutual help, and this one is vulnerability. Uh, by his wounds, we were healed. Though he knew what was in men, the incarnate word made vulnerable the heart of God. A perfect love casts out fear. The one who contemplates the transfigured wounds of Christ desires never again to say, I was naked, so I hid myself. Captivated by the beauty of a divine vulnerability, the companion responds with courage, rendering vulnerable his own opaque interiority. That in the risk that at in the risk of rejection, he gains the possibility of communion. Vulnerability with Christ in the presence of the brothers is the hallmark of the companion's common life. Mm, that's awesome. Mm. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah, the word vulnerability, vulnus in Latin is wound. So vulnerability is woundability. Mm. So the, the wounded mm. heart of Christ, the woundable, the vulnerable, woundable heart of Christ is the God making his own heart woundable. Mm. Yeah, and and uh, I love that the taking the risk of rejection mm. makes possible uh, the good of communion. Mm. Uh, our our friend uh, Father Ryan Mann uh, said something to me that he then forgot. Uh, I quoted it back to him, but he said, "Yes, it's a near occasion of communion." Mm. <laughs> I love um, that. That has it's worked. It, that's worked its way through. Like another priest, I think got that from you, who got it from Father Ryan, and so they they ha- we had it in a homily here. Like they said, they said we should look at temptation as a near near occasion of communion. Yeah, they might have said near occasion of intimacy, but yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, mm. it develops. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I can, I now I feel like I was put up to the whole Greek thing. I don't want to miss my opportunity. Yeah, I was gonna, for, uh, I was gonna say, and, you know, I was gonna say if so, if you both have time, I'm I'm fine to go over. So if you both have time, I would still like to hear what you have to say about the Greek, and then and then we <laughs> can, and then we'll hear more from Father Boniface when he comes back on for the episode about spiritual direction. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Which you now signed up for. <laughs> um, the the word in Greek is tapenos, and. Uh, Interestingly, it only appears in the Gospels twice. And you can guess who the two humble self-presentations are in the Gospels. He has looked with favor on his tapenos, doulos. Uh, I'm sure that's not conjugated correctly. Anyway, uh, um, but he has looked with favor on his humble slave or humble servant, lowly servant. That's Our Lady who, I, who owns her humility. And then uh, in the in the meek and humble of heart, and then the second is Jesus, who owns his humility. In Matthew eleven twenty eight or twenty nine, uh, be imitators of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. So those are the only two occurrences of that uh, that word in Greek for humility in the Gospels. Mary and Jesus doesn't get a lot better than that <laughs> as our exemplars of humility, who are of course the greatest. Right, mm. Jesus is God. And Mary is the greatest creature, being the immaculate conception and the and the and the greatest of saints. You know, she she is the greatest, and she's able to to recognize her humility, her her lowliness. And Jesus, of course, who is God, uh, gives himself in as the one to imitate and in, in being uh, humble. Uh, so the the word occurs six times in the in the epistles of Saint Paul, and there's a, a little variation in uh, in application. I'm sorry, not even in uh, the epistles of St. Paul. Uh, actually, the, the two other most uh, related places are in James and First Peter. I should have just said the epistles. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, James, of course, we know that one well. Uh, God resists the proud and raises up the, uh, tapenos is the, is the word, raises up the lowly, raises up the humble. And that's a nice uh thing to keep in mind, you know, if, 
uh, if you're humble, people will resist you and, and might even hurt you like Father Michael was just describing. And sometimes we armor ourselves up with pride, superiority, or vainglory uh, in order to protect ourselves mm-hmm. against people. But do we want to be resisted by people or resisted by God? <laughs> That's our yeah. choice. I'd rather be resisted by people, humble, than be superior and be resisted by God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's clearly going to go worse. Uh, so it's a nice... Uh, uh, little way to apply. And then in First Peter, uh, that's James 4, verse 6. And then in First Peter 5, verse 5, he, uh, he says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. Uh, for, and then he quotes that same, for God opposes the proud uh, and gives grace to the humble. And so, uh, I'm sorry, those are both quotes from the Old Testament, I should have mentioned. Both James and Peter quote that Old Testament. Mm-hmm. Uh, statement, God opposes the proud, but but lifts up or gives grace to the humble. So St. Peter uses the image of clothing yourselves with humility, which is very interesting. It's, uh, you know, putting on this kind of transparent, it's like clothing yourself with an x-ray machine or something, mm-hmm. uh, putting on this kind of transparent presentation that we allow ourselves to be seen as we are. and Or we could say it's clothing ourselves in our flesh, rather than clothing ourselves in all kinds of other adornments, uh, letting ourselves be seen in all of the the weakness and beauty of flesh. And uh, um, I was thinking when Father Michael was describing earlier, you know, somebody who allows themselves to to be seen, it's such sacred ground. To actually see the person is such sacred ground. And that's why it's horrifying, like sacrilege and blasphemy are horrifying. It's horrifying when someone exploits humility and vulnerability because it's exploiting something so sacred. Uh, and that's the sacredness of our, of our flesh in the, in the genuine sense, not the kind of Pauline sense of flesh, but, but our nakedness, you know, to be naked and without shame, to be, to be seen as we are, that, that kind of, of nakedness, that that would ever be exploited or or. Uh, damaged, you know that, but but there's something that's just so sacred there, and and needs to be reverenced and and so uh, clothed, uh, interestingly, with uh, with humility. But anyway, a few few references to the to the Greek that give us a, a few more facets. Looking at Our Lady, looking at the Lord, it's the only thing that Jesus ever told us to imitate. He never, in any other context, said, "Be imitators of me." Uh, of course, he says, you know, love as as I love. So, but the word imitation is not used somewhere else by Jesus, uh, only in in terms of his humility. So, again, coming back to that point from the beginning, that humility is really the Christian virtue. Uh, it's the Christ like virtue, and Mary is the first one to have it. Uh, she who is full of grace, Kekaryatomene, uh, is also the one who is. Uh, who, who has that tapenos of Christ, that humility of Christ. She, she uh, em, uh, embodies that, that quality of him that he comes to share with us. He, he empties himself and takes the form of a slave, a, a humble slave, we might say, like Our Lady, uh, in order to, to save us, redeem us, and, and divinize us, ultimately make us one with him, to lift up the lowly by uniting us, bringing us home to the Father. I I do think that there's, um, I think there's one other place in the gospel, at least one other place that has the word, um, a different conjugation of it maybe, um, is in Matthew 23. I had just thought of this verse, so I just looked it up in the interlinear Bible. But in Matthew 23, when he, the whole like, woe to you, 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 Pharisees. Um, the, when he says, he who humbles himself shall be exalted, um, that one, but I mean, that still holds true to everything you just said. It also might not be the same word. Cause I don't know Greek that well. It's the verb. It's the verb form. No, uh-huh. you're, uh, I'm, I'm sure you're right. So I was looking at the, at the noun form. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So to, to humble oneself. Mm-hmm. Nice. So, um, that's really, I like, I like all that a lot, especially that your, your comments on the clothing ourselves in humility. It is a, a fascinating, um, a fascinating concept. Mm. Yeah. I also like, this is going way back, but when you were talking about humility and vulnerability and vulnerability being like humility in relationship, 
Um, I think there's something that's just been sitting with me this whole time because uh, I think it's very beautiful. But there's something about like, if humility is to know the truth, um, like vulnerability is allowing the truth to be known even in relationship, right? Like we can have this humility within ourselves, like you're saying, I can know the truth about myself, um, but then to bring that into relationship and to allow the other to also know the truth and to, anyways, there's there's just something, uh, there's something there. I like that a lot. Um, anything else from either of you before we wrap up? You distracted me looking up the verb form. Oh, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <laughs> just explaining my silence. Uh, yeah, that's good. So the verb, the verb uh, is 14 times in the New Testament, uh, eight of these in Matthew and Luke, and then six in the epistles. So mm. yes, we should study the uh, the verb form a bit as well. Although I, uh, several of the passages are precisely the one mm. in parallels of what you said in terms of those who humble themselves I, will be I, exalted. Sorry. Um, I, I still think that there's something like that even adds a further aspect to it though I think of like the implication there I'm I'm totally stretching this I'm totally stretching it and I'll own that but like an implication there could be that the only ones who actually possess as in it's a noun like the the ones who possess humility are Mary mm. and Jesus and all other uses of it are um the action of humbling right like <laughs> Um, to uh, like, because, because this has to be an action. This has to be something that we, we grow in something that we practice, something that we learn. Um, and they're the only two who are, are mentioned as like having it. Um, so there is something there that I think is really interesting. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, to tie in another theme that we touched on. So in Matthew 18, four, uh, whoever humbles himself like this child. So mm. brings us into that. And I think that even to think of humbling as a verb, again, to, to come around to the, uh, the distortion that um, Mother Natalia started out with that we often find in humility, that humbling is somehow beating ourselves up or making ourselves useless or declaring ourselves worthless or something like that. But, but humbling is really more related to that vulnerability. Uh, it's really it's it's letting our humility be seen. It's it's owning our humility. It's acknowledging our humility. It's uh, and and so uh, bringing it into relationship. And and I think that's a that's a nice connection for us when we bring our our humility into because ultimately we open to God through humility. We 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 open ourselves, expressing our need for Him, which is genuine. And, and uh, opening ourselves to receive from him like a little child. And, and that's precisely what divinizes us, right? That's mm. how we have the humble. Those who humble themselves will be exalted because we enter into relationship with the divine then, which is the exaltation. And, and we, are, we are raised up in him. So mm. uh, it's, uh, and, and of course, that has already happened to Our Lady and, and Jesus is himself divine and, uh, and the union of the human and divine and his divine person. So... Yeah, that's a, that's a great, great connection, Mother. Way to think on your toes. <laughs> okay. Father Michael, anything before we nope. wrap up? Okay. Very good. Um, this has been so great. Uh, Amen. And again, Amen. I'm just so happy that I had an hour and seven minutes with Father Boniface, but I'm also really yeah. happy to just share him with the world, with all our listeners and um yeah, and they can experience Father Boniface through my heart, which is really beautiful. So, um, all right, prayer intentions. You know how we told Father Boniface to think of this ahead of time? I did not. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's great. Um, I was just banking on going third myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, please pray for, oh, I can't say that. I can't, I can't share that. Oh, that's really unfortunate. I really want to share it. Um, okay. Uh, the public prayer intentions and the private prayer intentions. Yeah, that's, that's the truth. Um, okay, please pray for um, Chris Parisi, who I recently got to spend time with, and she's just a really beautiful soul. And um, I think that she has a lot of this humility that we're talking about. 
So please pray for Chris. Nice. Um, I did not prepare either. Um, <laughs> I will say, I will say, pray for as it's I'll just constantly my mind supposedly. But as we await a bishop, um, as we await someone, pray for those who are leading our eparchy now. Um, Father Diodoro Mendoza, Bishop Thomas Olmsted, um, the various Sincelli, Father Stephen Washko, Father Michael Mandelis, Father Marcus Gamori, Father Bob Rankin, um, those who kind of have the regions and, and all of us who, who take in our various ways of, of leadership are trying to, to make up from the fact that we're waiting for a bishop and, and doing that to one extent or the other. But um, for those who kind of don't have the don't have the honor of being um, ordained to the episcopate, but have the responsibilities nonetheless in the meantime, um, without without any of the glory. So um, please pray for them. Beautiful. Um, I would just ask prayers for my my seminarians. As I, as I said, I'm the spiritual director for about 40 diocesan seminarians. I, I'm not, I don't direct all of them personally, but I'm sort of over the whole group and they always feel like my boys. So uh, asking prayers for my, my boys as they discern their vocations and, and grow uh, in their union with Christ in order to uh, hopefully be altar Christi and uh, bring Christ to the world through the beautiful gift of the priesthood. But it's, uh, it's hard. Seminary is hard. It's uh Father Michael can uh, testify to, I'm sure. <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's a lot of uh, humbling that happens there in seminary and uh, a lot of challenges. And maybe so. also some humiliating. <laughs> yes, some humiliating can also find its way in there. That's true. <laughs> yeah. um, great. Oh, we should have. Okay, whatever. Um, great. Great to be with you both. I uh, love you both very much. Um, you too. Spiel. Um, you can find our podcast on whatever you're listening to it on right now. Um, and <laughs> then we have a, we're on the social media stuff, the, the Facebook and the Father Michael has a Twitter at Padre Michael O. Um, we have Instagram and is that all the social media? I think so. Facebook. I said Facebook. I said Facebook. Cowboy can check us. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and then, <laughs> and we have a Goodreads. We have um, a, a website, whatgodisnot.com. Um, you can check out our nonprofit at fotina, P H O T I N A dot org. Um, and if you go on our Patreon, you can support Fotina, which also supports the podcast, um, as well as our other tithing and. Um, Ministry to the Poor. And I think you can email us, what God is not podcast at gmail.com. I think that seems like enough. Um, Father Boniface, can you please give the blessing today? I'd love to. Heavenly Father, thank you for the gift of this time with Mother Natalia and Father Michael. Thank you for the grace that you have given each of us to be Christian. Be with all of our listeners and help them to embody that grace in all of the humility of our humanity and our fallen nature and with all of our trust and need placed in the hands of our Lord and Savior. And I ask you through the intercession of Our Lady and St. Joseph, our own patron saints and guardian angels, Pour out your blessing upon us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.